What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and today I've got a super exciting build guide for you. But also, in case you haven't already seen, we've hit 100,000 subscribers on the GeekerWatt channel, which, I mean, that's insane. That's so crazy. I've got some balloons to celebrate, although this one is um, it's not having a good day. It wasn't having a good day yesterday. But anyway, I digress. We've got a really cool build guide for you today featuring... Featuring... This. <laughs> I knew this electric desk would come in handy. There we go, the new Razer Tomahawk 80X case. Now, as always, I'm gonna run you through all the parts I selected and why today, the build process step by step before booting this machine up to see exactly how it performs in a load of the latest and most popular AAA titles. So buckle in, get subscribed if you aren't already, but let's dive into it. Today's video is brought to you by Monster Legends, a free to play game on both iOS and Android, available for download at the first link in the description below. But James, we want to hear more. What is Monster Legends? Well then, it's a game that lets you battle legendary monsters. There are literally hundreds of monsters to both catch and collect, and you can even breed two monsters together to create a new monster, just like real life. No, wait. Let's move on. Build up your strategy and set your monster teams, combining tanks, attackers, and supporters exactly how you like them. What's more, there are different PvP modes based on these epic special dungeon and adventure maps, which allow you to battle your friends in real time to see just who's gonna come out on top. One thing I really like about the game is that there are new events every single week, which allow you to discover and play new adventures. If you check out and download the game at the first link in the description below, you'll get a special reward worth $30 for completely free. You'll get 50,000 food, an epic monster, Sybeel, and 300,000 gold. You heard me right, 300 thousand gold. That is an epic reward to get started with Monster Legends. But as I say, remember, if you want to claim this reward worth $30, you've got to download through the first link in the description below, so you don't miss out on all the Monster Legends fun. Go and catch them all and let me know how you get on down in the comments section below. And once again, a big thank you to Monster Legends Catch All for sponsoring today's video. A really, really cool game. But let's get back to the build. Now, as always today, I'm gonna to kick things off by installing our CPU into our motherboard, doing our RAM, SSD, and all of that sort of stuff. For the motherboard today, I've actually gone the B550 route, and this board has the same name as the case. That isn't the reason I chose it though. B550 is really, really great value, and actually sometimes will have slightly better overclocking performance in terms of your VRMs and stuff in comparison to a kind of more budget-friendly X570 board. Plus, we've got no active cooling on the heatsink uh, for our chipset, so no annoying fan or anything like that, which keeps our noise today down to a minimum. I'm going to be coupling our motherboard today with this, which is AMD's new Ryzen 5 5600X. It's a six core and 12 thread chip that finally beats out Intel on pure kind of per clock performance. And what I mean by that is your single threaded optimized games, which are still your GTA 5s of this world and can't leverage the whole CPU are still nicely covered here. Installing the chip's pretty easy. Find the golden triangle on the bottom left corner of the CPU and line this up with the triangle on the top left of the socket. In order to do this, we just need to pull up this retention arm, which is super duper easy. Look, you can kind of see it just comes up and down a little something like that and line those triangles up, drop the CPU in. You can give it a bit of a wiggle if it makes you feel better and then drop the retention arm back down. That brings us nicely onto our RAM choice today. And the RAM actually ties in perfectly with our CPU cooler. And by that, it's actually liquid cooled. Now the RAM looks pretty good as a standalone kind of clean black finish, but the CPU cooler will bolt onto the top and just help our RAM temperatures, which is a bit overkill, I know, but it is going to look pretty awesome. Installing your RAM's pretty easy. Pull back the clips on the second and fourth RAM dim slots, and then line the notch on the RAM with the notch on the motherboard. Try and make sure the TT logo is at the top of the board, and that will help you get your orientation right the first time round. In order to make sure it clicks into place, you just want to slot it into the slot and then apply even pressure to both sides of the DIN. That brings us nicely on to our storage choice today then. Specifically, this is Seagate's Barracuda 510. It's an NVMe Gen 3 drive, so not quite a Gen 4 drive, though their Firecuda 520 covers that base quite nicely, but it's a pretty affordable NVMe SSD that's gonna boot into your system like that, nice and fast. In order to install this, we need to grab our teeny tiny little screwdriver. It makes a return for 2021 to just remove the pre-installed M.2 heatsink today. And 
And with that removed, we can then just slide the SSD into place. Line up the gold notch with the corresponding silver slot on the motherboard. You sometimes have to slide the drive in at a bit of like a 45 degree angle and then push it downwards. That can make your installation that little bit easier. Boom, that was so easy. And then we're just gonna take one of these teeny tiny little retention screws that comes included in your motherboard's box to actually fasten and secure the SSD. There we go, a little bit fiddly, secure the SSD down into place. And then we're just gonna drop the actual heatsink cover back on. Very random, I know, but I've gotta say the heating in the new office is making me feel complete. We moved office, by the way. If you wanna see a studio tour, make sure you get subscribed. We're gonna do a whole big series on it. It's gonna be awesome. It's massive, like this space is, is huge. Like, I can't even explain to you how big. Dan, can you like pan around and show them the office? Yes. Look at that! Wait, there's a light. Oh, mate, it's bloody huge! It's huge! No, not too many spoilers though. We need, we need you tuning in. Right, with that done, I was going to say let's move on to the cooler, but we can't do that really until the whole thing is moved into our case today, which I know you Razer fans are going to be happy about. It's making an entrance in today's build nice and early. I say that, I'm pretty excited. Like, I won't crash into the balloons this time round, but like already, I'm already feeling like this is a pretty premium experience. I mean, that packaging is like pretty top notch. We've got some nice soft foam with like a cardboard outer. I haven't seen that in a long time it's really heavy like this case is steering like this is ridiculous like that have you seen what i'm seeing there's an rgb on the bottom of the case i mean i don't think i've ever seen that really like, it's been done before but like not to that level that's ridiculous <laughs> apparently you just push the door what's going on mate this is some like, I feel like I'm on a plane or something. It, it's ridiculous. Oh my God, the other one, the one that you don't even use does the same thing. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. Can you got, you see the nano leaf on the, see? Office move series, you gotta be there. So do these side panels actually come off though? I don't, I don't think they do. Or if they do, it looks like a lot of faff. So let's leave them on. Put foam in the power supply. I don't really know if that's necessary, but I'm not, I'm not knocking it. And then at the back, it seems like we've got a load of like cable management options, which is, which is good, not, not a bad thing. This kind of reminds me of the modular Cooler Master system, very similar actually, where you can kind of just like add or take away panels as you see fit. This has only got two, which is probably better. I mean, the Cooler Master one at one point had like eight and it was just it was just stupid. All the cables are nicely rooted. We look like we've got some sort of controller at the back here. I'm guessing that's for lighting and stuff, but we'll probably find out. We've got USB-C on the top. We've got some green, I presume they're USB-3. Yep, USB-3 uh, Razer USB ports. <laughs> It's all fine. Oh, I was wrong. Ah, so the hinge actually stays on and then the glass just like popped onto the hinge. That's very clever. Genuine. So I've just moved the thing. No way. Oh my God, this is so like over-engineered in a good way. Now I do want to address before I just like keep going on about how like amazing this case seems uh, so far. It isn't cheap. Like fundamentally this case is not cheap. It's an expensive chassis. This for me has got features already that I'm like looking at and going, well, why has no one else done that? And, and there probably are cases out there that have done something similar to this before. I'm not going to like say that, that that doesn't exist. But like a lot of the cases I've dealt with, even at this price point, uh, this is just seems quite well thought out, right? And it, it's, it's quite a big, case for what is fundamentally really a an ATX chassis, right? It's probably not a full tower, it's more of a mid tower, but so far, so good. Let's install the motherboard, I think, first of all. No RGB fans and only only one fan in the whole case. That is a big downside. I mean, at this price point, that's probably not that acceptable, but, but anyway, let's get the motherboard in uh, and our radiator is going to give us plenty of airflow at the front and go from there. Just going to casually drop down my door to access the, uh, the, the included box of brown screws. Razor don't seem to be doing anything to special here. You just get the standard uh, motherboard, installation screws, a few cable ties, and some stickers. Rightio, the case uh, is now kind of sorted from the sense of the motherboard is now screwed into place, which brings us nicely on to actually installing our radiator. Now, whoa, oh my god, that was so easy. That's really heavy. Like, what, what are you making this case out of, Razor? You make it out of, like, iron? You make it out of iron? Right, now moving on to the radiator. I've talked a lot about it, but not actually shown you what it is. This is the Thermaltake Flow RC360. I believe Thermaltake now have a pretty good RGB integration with Razer if we wanted to use their software suite, although there isn't really much Razer RGB on this case, if any, which is a bit of a disappointment, a bit of a shame, but like, never mind, it could look good when it's on, and so far the build experience seems pretty positive. So, as I alluded to earlier, this is what's going to clip onto our RAM dims and light those up and keep them nice and cool with a copper contact plate, but overkill, but never mind, and then that's what's going to cool our CPU down, all in this really nice 360mm radiator. The radiator itself 
is going to slide nicely into place. And then I think if we pop the fans on this side, we can kind of clamp the two together. And really, job's going to be a good one. With the radiator in and the front panel now securely back on, we're just going to install the CPU cooler by popping this kind of mounting bracket around the bottom of the water block. This is going to screw into our RAM, but we're going to do that in just a second. But first, we just need to make sure that we've got everything to do with the CPU cooler around our CPU socket ready to go. Basically, you want to take it with the AMD side facing this way and then take these included stopper screws. They're going to pop through the outermost holes on each of the four AMD corners and then that is going to pop through the rear of the case. In order to do this though, we need to remove the pre-installed plastic mounting hardware for this to go through the motherboard and the block to fasten nicely on top. I think that wasn't too complicated. Hopefully that all made a little bit of sense. Let me know in the comments down below. Coolio, this is looking actually really good now. I'm like super duper happy with how this is turning out. The radiator's in, the fans are in, the front panel's on, the RAM cooler's on. It's looking good. We're happy with how everything is going. And basically, we've only got two more components left to install our power supply and the graphics card. Let's do our PSU and all our cables and our wiring first and finish on a high with our GPU. Talking of the power supply, I've got this. It's the Cooler Master MWE Gold 750V2. It's a fully modular 80 plus gold certified power supply, meaning you only plug in the cables you need, helping with our cable management today. It's a little bit of a chunky boy. It's not the smallest power supply ever, but it's also not massive, you know, and 750 watts is absolutely what you want for a 3080 system. If you try and go much lower than that, you are gonna have problems, especially in terms of power surging on the 3080. I've tried running it on an MWE 650, for example, and it just doesn't work. So <laughs> don't bother. Now this power supply from Cooler Master is pretty affordably priced, though latest links for pricing and availability can be found in the description down below. In terms of what cables we need to plug in, the largest 24 pin motherboard power cable is first up, followed shortly after by a dual six plus two pin PCIe power connector. For the graphics card. We've also got a CPU 4 plus 4 pin power cable to power up our processor at the top left. And then finally, they're all bundled together, but we only need one of these SATA power harnesses. And this is going to power up basically the RGB and any other external hard drives or stuff that you want to plug in that aren't actually on the motherboard itself. And once we've done that, we can go ahead and just slide the power supply into the back of the case here and screw it in with the four screws a little something like this. We're going to follow this up by just plugging in some of our cables and wires before we go ahead and install the graphics card. The first of those cables and wires is our CPU power connector, which goes to the top left of the motherboard. The motherboard power supply connector is next up, goes to the right hand side of the motherboard, and it's the largest of the bunch today with 24 pins. Next up is our JFP1 front panel connectors. Bit of a complicated term, but don't worry. It's just a few little connectors for our power and reset buttons and any indicator LEDs at the top of the chassis. Bottom right at the motherboard, diagram on your screen, take it slow, and you're good to go. USB 3 is next up, not Type-C, the standard USB-A connector. This is notched, so we'll once again only go in one way around. We've also got HD audio today. This goes to the bottom left of the motherboard and makes the separate headphone and mic jacks, nice touch razor, work without any problems. Nice! With that all sorted and all out the way, it's time to install the GPU. This is the NVIDIA RTX 3080. This in particular is the Founders Edition card, although this case has got plenty of GPU clearance for something like an MSI Supreme or even like a Gaming X Trio card, for example. I'm a massive fanboy when it comes to the Founders Edition cards. NVIDIA were very kind to send these over when they first came out, but I think the design of these is just so sleek. It kind of gives me like Apple vibes, whereas obviously a card from a board partner is a little bit more out there. It really depends what you're into. This card is actually quite neatly within its two slot form factor as well, which is quite a nice touch. Temperatures on this thing are fantastic fantastic. And even though it is going to be pulling air in through the card up to the top of the chassis, because we've got liquid cooling, it's not going to affect our RAM or our CPU temperatures today. The one thing I'm not completely kind of sold on with this card is this little power connector. If you could get power supply cables out the box that went straight into the card, it would look super clean. But with the horrible, ugly adapter and the placement right in the middle, it's just not great. But you know, you win some, you lose some. In order to install the graphics card, we just need to kind of line it up with the PCIe slot, which will tell us that we 
we need to remove the second and third PCIe slot covers. We can do this. Oh, they've got special holes. Well, they're tight. By just removing the thumb screws, which are way too tight to remove with your thumbs, spoiler alert. What are you trying to do to me, Razor? I know the gyms are closed, but... Whoa. And there we go. Those are now out. And then we can just slide the graphics card into the slot. And it just about squeezed nicely back into place. Use those same thumb screws. And with that, the graphics card is in. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie, this build looks awesome. Like, I've built quite a few 3080 systems recently. But like, as far as aesthetics go, I think this thing is going to look great. I might whack in an extra RGB strip or two. But I think really, there's only one thing left to do before we boot this machine up, see how it performs, do our BIOS and drivers and all that good stuff. And that's to see just how good it looks when it's all powered up. Roll the montage. <laughs> All right then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up, and of course the build process, let's take a dive and see exactly how it performs in more than 15 of the most popular titles. And new for this video, in the description below there's a playlist with the full kind of five minute gaming benchmarks for each title on a new channel that we call Benched. So go and check that out, but let's kick it off with Death Stranding. 4K high settings with DLSS enabled and set to quality to give us that all important frame rate boost sees this system perform 149 frames per second on average with 134 and 124 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Grand Theft Auto 5 is next up today. The game's inbuilt benchmarking mode performed exceptionally well to be honest with you. 130 frames per second on average with 120 and 104 for the 90 and 99th percentile our results and many of the settings you saw a second ago tuned down other than that 4k resolution. Apex Legends is next up today then first off is 4k high before looking at the lower 1440p resolution and here you're looking 91, 82 and 76 frames per second respectively. The game looked really great, really smooth and performed really well, never really dropping below that 76 fps mark. Say though you've got a 1440p 165 hertz panel and you want that extra frame rate, well no worries. 1440p high settings gives you 194 fps on average with 162 and 140. Make sure to jump into your origin settings in the origin launcher to unlimit that frame rate otherwise it will get stuck around 140 frames per second. Next up then is our Call of Duty titles today. First of all Warzone at 4k high settings gives us 98, 85 and 80 frames per second. Not a bad showing whatsoever and then tuning down to 1440p high settings once again no ray tracing supported in the free battle royale mode takes us up to 127 112 and 99 so either way you're getting some really great well above 60 fps in some cases above 120 fps fps frames per second in Call of Duty's Warzone. Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War is a little bit more difficult to run. 4K high settings with RTX enabled, because of course that is a thing in Cold War, and DLSS turned on, gives us 71, 62, and 54. And this is tested in online multiplayer zombies, not the game's campaign mode, because I think more of you guys are going to play zombies than the campaign. 1440p is also really positive on the performance front. High settings with DLSS enabled once again, gives you 142, 124, and 111 frames per second. Overwatch is next up today then. 4K Ultra settings gives us 258, 242, and 211 frames per second. Once again tested in the game's online multiplayer mode, and really the game looked fantastic. These are esports level frame rates at 4K Ultra settings, which is mental. CSGO is next, 4K high settings, we're looking 360 frames per second. NVIDIA's Frame View app, which we use for all our frame rate recording, doesn't really work with CSGO, but still 360 FPS is a really great result. Talking of great results, Minecraft RTX, the game that's technically out of beta, but in my view is still, well, a little bit in beta. 60 frames per second on average with 58 and 55 makes this a really good experience, but definitely nowhere near the frame rate of vanilla Minecraft 
Minecraft, or at least a Minecraft without ray tracing. So definitely something to consider. Doom Eternal is next. 4K Ultra Nightmare. What a name for a preset. 147 FPS with 135 and 118 for the 90 and 99th percentiles. Next up then is Rainbow Six Siege. We are motoring through them today. 4K, very high settings in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. Give us 221, 193 and 171 FPS. But James, that's not enough frame rate, you say. Rubbish, I reply. But nevertheless, we did test it at 1440p. Very high settings as well. Knock that resolution down. And that jumps us up nicely to 307 frames per second on average. Next up today then is Valorant. 4K high settings gives you 369 frames per second with 295 and 219. The game looked great, super easy to run, a bit like CSGO on today's list. Watch Dogs is next up today then, first at 4K with both DLSS and ray tracing enabled, and that gives you 71, 67 and 66 frames per second, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. This increases to 106, 99 and 92 for the average 90 and 99th percentile results when you turn RTX off, but otherwise keep high settings and DLSS enabled. Cyberpunk 2077 is next up on my list today, first at 1440p high settings with DLSS on and RTX on as well, and that gives us 67, 59 and 52 Ouch! Dropping below 60 FPS for that 99th percentile at 1440p is not great. Turning RTX off though at 1440p brings us up to 90, 77 and 66. So either way, you're still getting between 60 and 90 frames per second on average, but definitely something to consider on this front. Next up today then, the final title of all of the games today is Fortnite. I tested it with a range of different variations and as I said earlier, if you want to see the full extended non-cut down clips, they'll be linked in a playlist down below. First off is 1440p DLSS performance with RTX disabled and that gives us 148 frames per second on average. Move over to 1440p low or competitive settings with everything tuned down but our render distance set to far and that takes you up to 208, 184 and 160 frames per second. But James, I want even more competitive. I don't need that 1440p resolution. What about 1080? 1080? 80p on a 3080 is quite the spectacle. So much so, we're looking at 229 frames per second on average. That is ridiculous. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps up not only the game and benchmarks today, but the whole video. If you enjoyed today's video though, make sure to drop a like rating, get subscribed, and remember, you can download the Monster Legends game from today's video sponsor at the first link below. Use that link to ensure you get for free a reward worth $30 that includes 50,000 food, an epic monster Sibiel, and 300,000 gold. A massive thank you to Monster Legends Collectal for kindly making today's video possible. And as always, we'll see you in the next one. Go catch them all.